everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you back to another episode of this uh, interesting series that uh, we've been going through myself and Dr. David Wood, our dear brother and guest on this show. Uh, the series, as uh, you've noticed, uh, has to do basically with multiple arguments raised by our Muslim friends related to different topics. Some of it has to do with the Quran, some of it has to do with uh, Muhammad himself, and others has to do uh, with things outside really of the Quran or Muhammad, like today's uh, argument that we're going to address, which has to do with this supposed argument that because Islam is rapidly growing, then it must be a true religion. Dr. Wood, welcome back. All right, well, uh, this is yet another example of an argument where the argument is flawed on multiple levels. And we've seen this over and over again with Muslim arguments. When Muslims claim, or when Allah claims, that if we can't write something like the Quran or a chapter of the Quran, then it must be from God. The argument's flawed on multiple levels because even if it's the case, even if it's the case that Islam, that, that, that the Quran cannot be produced by anyone else, that no one else can write like the Quran, that wouldn't make it the word of God because that would just mean it has a unique style. Um, so again, e even if we could, uh, we couldn't write something like the plays of Shakespeare or the symphonies of Mozart, that wouldn't make these inspired by God. It would just mean they had a style that was, that was different or unique or better than other people. So best case scenario for Muslims, that would mean that Muhammad was just a, a, a great writer with a unique style, wouldn't have anything to do with whether it's from God. Uh, but the, the other problem is when we actually look at the Quran, it's just not impressive at all. And we, again, we see this over and over again with Muslim arguments that they're not just flawed in one way, they're flawed in multiple ways. And this is yet another example because when Muslims say, and th by the way, this is, this is extremely popular. It, uh, it happens at almost the end of every interaction I have with Muslims. They'll start off by making some argument about scientific miracles in the Quran or something like this. Then we'll actually start going through them. I'll refute them, show them that, that the argument is silly, and then they'll conclude with, well, Islam is still the fastest growing religion in the world. Or I'll make a video about, uh, about all of the, you know, Muhammad's silly teachings and so on, and Muslims will respond, but Islam's the fastest growing religion in the world. So this is sort of supposedly their clincher. Right. But to, the idea that something is true because it, it's growing rapidly or it has expanded is so incredibly silly that Muslims would not take this even as evidence if it were being used of anything else, right? So, so today, um, the new atheism has, has been spreading rapidly among many people. What does that have to do with whether it's true. Well, Muslims would say nothing at all. It, exactly. it has nothing to do. That, that would show you how, you know, how sinful people are and how much they want to rebel against God. Um, Christianity is the largest religion in history. It has about 2.2 billion followers of various kinds of, of Christians in the world. Would Muslims say that that proves that Christianity is true and therefore that Islam is false? Absolutely not. They would not take that even seriously as an argument. But Notice the similarities there. Christianity is the largest religion in history, therefore it must be true. Islam is growing fastest, therefore it must be true. Very similar types of arguments, but Muslims take one very seriously and they wouldn't take the other as any evidence at all. Um, so there's a question of if, if something is spreading rapidly, does that have something to do with whether it's true? Well, one of the fastest spreading movements in history was communism. I mean, it took over massive portions of the world um, within a few decades. What does that have to do with whether it's from God? It spread far, far more rapidly than Islam did. So and it denies God. Yeah, and, and what does that have to do with whether it's from God? Nothing. So over and over again, if you gave Muslims a list of rapidly growing ideologies, rapidly spreading ideologies, and said, does this have anything to do with whether this is from God? Over and over again, they would say, no. But here we get to Islam, suddenly Islam is growing rapidly, therefore God must be supporting this religion, must be showing the world that this is the truth. So right. that's one problem, that's one problem. So Correct. even though Islam is growing rapidly, it makes absolutely no sense to say this is growing rapidly, therefore it must be the truth. But there's a second problem, namely 
that we know exactly why Islam is growing rapidly. Because the polls, the polls that Muslims refer to, the, the Pew Research studies and so on Correct. that show how rapidly Islam is growing, and that I think it's somewhere in the, in the, in the 2050s when Islam and Christianity are going to be neck and neck, where, where Islam is going to catch up with Christianity. The same Pew Research studies that argue that Islam is growing rapidly, they say why Islam is growing rapidly. And they say Islam is growing rapidly primarily due to high birth rates Correct. among Muslims. Correct. And no, it doesn't matter where you go, if it's in the United States, if it's in Europe, if it's in the Middle East, if it's in Africa, if it's in Southeast Asia, wherever you have Muslim communities, Muslim communities have higher birth rates than the non-Muslim communities. In other words, what you're saying, it's not convergent to Islam. That's right. It's just from within the mm -hmm. community itself. Yeah. There are people who convert to Islam, but that is not that is not why Islam is growing as, as rapidly as Correct. it is. Uh, you have lots of people leaving Islam, and even among converts in the in the United States, the, the the study at least a few years ago was that over half of people who convert to Islam leave Islam within two years. So, Atheism is flourishing in the Middle East right now. Yeah. Um, so this isn't about conversions. Muslims make it look like it is when they say, ah, Islam is expanding so rapidly, it's growing so rapidly, it's because all these people are recognizing that it's the truth. No, Islam is expanding rapidly because of high birth rates. Uh, and there, there, there are another couple of factors um, that have impacted Islam's uh, uh, growth historically. I want to look at um, two passages, one from the Hadith and one from the Quran. Um, but as far as rapid growth, um, in Sahih al-Bukhari, Number 6922, Muhammad said, whoever changed his Islamic religion, kill him. If you're not free to leave a religion, that has a lot to, that, if you can enforce that, that we, you will not leave this religion or we will kill you. Right. If you can enforce that, you've already, you've already developed a fairly rapidly growing system in the sense that other, other ideologies in order to grow have to gain new followers, either by having babies or by and, and getting the children to believe, uh, or by conversions and so on. Um, you have to expand that way. Um, but at the same, at, at that time, at, as long as you're expanding, you have to, in order to grow, you have to be getting new people faster than you're losing people. Right? Every other movement in the world, there, there, are, there are people who leave it and people who go into it. If your movement is growing, then it has to be growing because you're, you're getting more people than you're losing. If you can build it into your system that no one's going to leave it because you'll die, well, all you can do is gain then, right? All you're going to do is gain. You might lose people through war and so on, but if you're not le losing people to conversion, you've already insulated yourself from, from one kind of, uh, of, of way of reducing your population. Um, not only that, um, one of the reasons that, that people would, would leave is by applying critical thought and, and seeing that arguments are bad and thinking through these things, and Islam frowns upon critical thought when dealing with Muhammad. And this goes back to the Quran. Lots of other passages here, but I'll read chapter 4, verse 65. Allah says, But no, by your Lord, they can have no faith until they make you, O Muhammad, judge in all disputes between them and find in themselves no resistance against your decisions and accept them with full submission. Notice, a true believer, someone who has true Islamic faith, will find in himself no resistance against Muhammad's decisions and will accept Muhammad's decisions with full submission. Part of Islam means submission, but it's not just submission to Allah, right. it's submission to Muhammad's decisions as well. So rejecting even one teaching of Muhammad, according to this verse, means that you're not a Muslim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you, and, and by the way, pe people who are, People who are wondering why ISIS, you know, kills so many people, because what do we hear over and over again? Oh, ISIS is killing Muslims, therefore they're not real Muslims. What do you have right here, right? What, one, we, we already saw if you are an apostate, if you're an apostate, the penalty is death. What does Allah say right here? If you have any doubts about any of Muhammad's decisions, you're not a real Muslim. So if you've, if you've recited the creed, if you've recited the Shahada, then you've become a Muslim. But according to this, if you reject anything Muhammad said, you're not a real Muslim. Absolutely. Now, uh, when ISIS goes out and they, they kill Shias or other groups, 
are they killing Muslims they regard as good, devout Muslims? Or are they killing Muslims they regard as hypocrites and apostates? You're right. And with that, I want to piggyback on this particular issue. Even, let's hypothetically speak and say, Islam is growing for other reasons. Mm -hmm. Which branch of Islam are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Are we talking about the Sunni branch mm -hmm. who's growing? Are we talking about the Shia branch that is growing? Are we talking about Ahmadiyya branch? Are we talking about the Sufi branch? In fact, there is a chart, you know, if, if we uh, can show that yeah. to our audience here. And look at it. I mean, look at how many just generic branches are out there. So which one of those branches is the one that is really growing the most? In fact, if you go to the same survey, the Pew Research, you'll discover that actually uh, it seems like the Shia Muslims are gaining more ground than the Sunnis if you think about the growth rate from here until 2030. Does that mean Islam will, grow, will be growing? Would the Sunni person admit now that the Shia branch will become more dominant or become basically uh, larger in number? Because we have but to ask if, ourselves. If, if, we, if, we follow, if we follow the reasoning that they give, right. then if, if the, the rate at which something is growing is evidence of its truth, then all Muslims would have to do is look at statistics about which group is growing most rapidly, and they would say, that's the group I have to, the group of Islam, that's the sect I have to That I have to, to follow, because exactly. Because that's the truth. Exactly. But they won't follow that reasoning, right? They won't do it. Absolutely. And so, so it's, it's just a, 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 the argument itself is just silly uh, mm -hmm. to, to use something like this as, just as an example, because uh, any group could be growing in certain area more so than others, and they could be, like you said, atheists, mm -hmm. they could be Hindus, it could be anything else. Does that mean that's the group that I have to follow in that particular area just because their number is increasing? Yeah, and, and it changes from time to time, right? I mean, Correct. you know, what the fastest growing movement in the 19th century is different from the fastest growing movement in the 20th century and so on. Is the truth changing? Well, it is if, if this argument is actually a, a serious argument. Uh, but so anyway, there's a, we, we have the, the killing of apostates. Um, we have the warning about doubting things that Muhammad said or, or criticizing things that Muhammad has, has uh, Muhammad's decisions. And so this really discourages critical thought of Muhammad, right? Because right. if you have any doubt about something Muhammad has said, right? So if Muhammad says you, you dunk your fly into a, a drink to make sure you get all the, the cure for the diseases that the, mm -hmm. that the fly is carrying, uh, if you say, you know, I've taken biology class and I don't think that's right. It's, it's, the Quran says you're not even a real Muslim because you're doubting Muhammad's decisions. Right. So there's not a lot of critical thought about things that Muhammad has said. Um, so we have lots of leaving Islam and thinking critically about Islam, um, very strongly discouraged by the religion. Uh, but the primary, the primary cause of Islam's growth is Islam's treatment and view of women. Correct. What, how are women treated where, where you grew up in, in Saudi Arabia? Well, of course, they have uh, n nothing near the rights of men, of course. Uh, they cannot drive. Uh, they are obviously a, a, a step below uh, when it comes to equality with men. And there is many other things, of course, that they have to adhere to the Islamic teaching according to the Quran and the traditions of the Prophet. Mm -hmm. And viewers might be wondering, what's the connection here? What's the connection between uh, treatment of women and rapid growth of Islam? Well, there's a definite, very clear connection here. Uh, namely, that the more opportunities women have in life, um, the more of an impact you have on birth rates. So right. like in a place like the United States where, you know, uh, you know a girl grows up, um, she goes to school, she goes to high school, she, many of them go off to college, then start a career and so on, then get married and so on. Um, women and girls, I mean, women are, are, are start getting married in, you know, at, at 24, 25, 30, things like that before they're even starting their families. If you're in a place where you don't have those kinds of opportunities, where women do not have those kind of opportunities, where they do they, they don't go to school, where they certainly don't go to college, where they don't have a career, these, these girls get married off at 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, and they start having kids then, right? right. So you have, you have lots of women in the West who, yes, I'll have my kid after I finish my school, finish my education, get my career started, then I have the kid, and then maybe you have one or two kids, if Correct. you have any. By the time 
you know, a girl in Afghanistan or Pakistan or Saudi Arabia is 25, she's had six or eight children. That's right. But because of the treatment of women, because women have fewer opportunities in Islam, as far as education, career, and so on, because of the impact of Islam on Islam's view of women, that they shouldn't be doing a lot of these things. I mean, think, in, in Pakistan, I mean, they will shoot girls in the head for going to school, right? They will show up and throw acid on them. They will blow up their schools exactly. to keep these girls from going to school. Why? They understand that this will have a massive impact on their culture if girls are becoming educated, that this will impact, um, you know, the, the entire system, the entire system. Now girls are going to school. Now they're going off to college. Now they're having careers. This changes everything. Now we're not marrying them at 13 and 14 years old. They understand this changes everything. And you've got the Taliban and they're killing, killing girls over this, over this sort of thing. Right. But they are right in the sense of how much that would impact the Islamic community. Because Islam, at the end of the day, is growing because it has a negative impact on the opportunities girls and women have. Because girls don't go off and have a lot to do, they have almost nothing to do in many Islamic communities apart from getting married off at 13, 14, 15 and starting their family immediately and they end up having far more children than other communities. And therefore the population, the Muslim population, explodes because they're just having more kids than other people. And the population grows but because Muslim countries are so inherently unstable because of the commands to fight hypocrites and kill hypocrites and so on. They then flee those Muslim countries as fast as they can and they immigrate to the West, to the United Kingdom or to the United States and so on. Uh, and I don't blame them for wanting to get out of, out of those areas where they might be killed just because of their particular view of Islam. So when we ask ourselves why, as far as just raw numbers, why is Islam growing so rapidly? Right. It's growing rapidly because of high birth rates due to few opportunities for women in Muslim nations. Why is Islam growing rapidly, rapidly expanding in the West? It's expanding rapidly in the West due to high birth rates of Muslims even in the West and immigration of people leaving Muslim countries because Islam really doesn't do a good job making stable societies that people want to live in. So the real reason Islam is growing rapidly is Islam makes violent societies where people do not feel safe and they want to leave. And Islam has a low view of women that does not give women many opportunities in life. And so they right. have more babies because they start having babies earlier because there's nothing else for them to do. So if we lay out the argument in all its fullness, That's if we right. state why, Muslims would have to say, here's how we know that Islam is true. Islam is true because it gives girls and women few opportunities in life and reduces them to baby making machines. That's what they're good for. And second, Islam makes such violent, inhospitable places to live. It, it, it makes countries places where people don't want to live and they want to get out of them as fast as possible. And therefore Muslims leave these countries and they move to countries around the world. So Islam is true because of the awful impact it has on women and because of the awful impact it has on societies. Therefore, Islam is true. Now, are you ready to accept Islam based on this brilliant argument? Of course not. And also, I want to add a couple of other factors. Polygamy, of course, is another factor. And at the same time, as you mentioned, because you have a lot of kids in a family, uh, it is basically estimated that almost one third of the population of Islam is age 15 and under. So which means they have even potential to even continue the mm -hmm. same pattern of uh, early marriages, more children and so on and so forth. So it really has nothing to do with conversion because that's usually the underlying, uh, uh, the underlining, of course, argument is like we're growing. That means Islam is true. People are accepting it and moving on basically with this fabulous religion. And that's usually how it goes. Well, um, that's yet uh, another exciting argument, of course. Um, let's let uh, our uh, audience know uh, what else uh, you think we'll be able to also address uh, in relationship to these arguments in the near future. Well, we have uh, another Quranic argument, and that's the argument that we know Muhammad was a prophet because the Bible talks about Muhammad coming as a that, prophet. That's an interesting one, of course. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, brother. And uh, thank you to our uh, uh, viewers for uh, watching uh, this show. Please send us your comments, of course, uh, uh, through Facebook. 
uh, reach out to us through our website. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Wood, maybe you mentioned to them also how they can get a hold mm -hmm. uh, of your website, if you like. A uh, quick way would be uh, go to YouTube, type in David Wood, and uh, you'll, you'll, of course, get a bunch of people who really don't like me, but you can, you can find my, my channel in there. Excellent. And uh, uh, we always welcome, of course, uh, any comments, and uh, hopefully you will join us again in the next uh, episode of this series. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thank you.